In September 1956, British-born American poet Denise Levitov was in Mexico and had been reading the second volume of Charles Olson's 650-page literary project, The Maximus Poems. She wrote to William Carlos Williams, saying, I have varying feelings about Olson. Sometimes he seems terrific, and at others incredibly bad and self-deluded. Williams himself responded in a letter published in 1971, the man is full of violent prejudices, which could be a good thing if they are intelligently ordered. His successes are well worth the rest of the whole poetic world, in his opinion, because he is not modest, which no poet can afford to be, irritating as it may be to the reader. In this short set of interviews, we'll hear from Professor Amiel Alcalay, who grew up in Gloucester, Massachusetts, while Olson was living and writing there. Basil King, a painter who studied at Black Mountain College while Olson was rector and Hetty Jones, who co-edited and published Charles Olson's manifesto, Projective Verse, with the Murray Baraka in 1950. Don't be bothered by the references. Uh, take my word for it that only the words uh, count. Anybody who's a, a pioneer in beginning anything uh, is bound to be criticized one way or another. It's a thinking about you have a problem at hand or you're at a particular juncture in a culture or politics, how are you going to attack it? What, what needs to be marshaled in order to get to the problem? Olson had found Maximus and brought him to Black Mountain. He brought him in his father's mailbag. He brought him from New England, so Charles wrote across the blackboard with white hands and white chalk. You drew for us the distance, and that was to learn division. The projective verse, um, we published his little pamphlet of that. We all jumped at the phrasing because really what does it mean the heart to the breath to the line he was very much an oral poet in that way we published a poem I've forgotten the title but it begins old Zeus young Augustus when you heard him read it and when you read it aloud you could see that it was in action what he was really trying to verbalize. So the distances are Galatea, and one does fall in love and desires mastery. Old Zeus, young Augustus. Love knows no distance, no place is that far away, or he changes into signals and control. Old Zeus, 
young Augustus. Death is a loving matter, then a horror we cannot bide and avoid. By greedy life we think all living things are precious pygmalions. A German inventor in Key West who had a Cuban girl and kept her after her death in his bed. After her family retrieved her, he stole the body again from the vault. One of my first thoughts in the police murder of the guy from Staten Island was the, the guy who had asthma, I can't breathe, you know. Olson was talking about breathing as a function of being alive. I have an extraordinary doctor who I've been seeing for about 20, 25 years, and he's said to me on numerous occasions, he said, if you ask me what it boils down to, in the end, you have to know how to breathe. It's a fundamental connection to your physicality, okay, and that derives from his piece, The Resistance, which he wrote after the Second World War with the revelation of the death camps and the nuclear bomb. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, in, in what, is, you know, what is literature, says the crisis of our time is a poetic crisis. Okay? So you can imagine how somebody like Olson, who leaves official life that could have had great dividends, he could have had a very serious political career. He was obviously very talented, but he didn't do that. Part of what he says there in that piece, The Resistance, is when bodies have been made into soap and when th all we have left is our, our skin, our tissue, our blood, our being. And so projective verse is about, it isn't like a yoga manual for creating verse, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental acknowledgement that to be alive you need to breathe and to understand what a poetics might mean, you need to understand who you are. As, as a breather, what, what your rhythm is, what your cadence is. Olson's greatest students are completely unlike him. You know, he was not interested in cloning anybody. He was interested in making people become more themselves. So you see that in John Wieners, you see that in Michael Rumaker, you see that in Ed Dorn. And I add, all of whom were either poor or working class people, you know, who Olson identified with immediately. I had been by myself for two days. It was Easter break. I had no money. I stayed in the studio working. You came looking for me. You thought maybe I had left. You knew I was lonely and I had a hard time with my work. You looked at all the paintings I had done. There were oils and paper. They were on the floors and on the wall. You said, wow, this should give you a lift. We went up to your house and you brought out a pinch bottle, good scotch, and Betty made food and it was friendly. You told me you were very concerned that so many of the students were veterans who had gone into the army right after high school and you didn't know what they were going to do when they left the protection of Black Mountain. We talked about the possibility of another war and I said my generation of Europeans would never go to war. You didn't say anything. I remembered we finished the bottle. I've had to learn the simplest things last, which made for difficulties. Even at sea, I was slow to get the hand out or to cross a wet deck. The sea was not finally my trade. But even my trade added, I stood estranged from that which was most familiar, was delayed, and not content with the man's argument that such postponement is now the nature of obedience, that we are all late in a slow time, that we grow up many, and the single is not easily known. I find there's stuff in Olson that is missing in almost anything else I encounter. There's just some other dimension that he hits. He turned his back on all institutional life in order to create other forms of consciousness and of thought. They're very radical ideas. You know, they may not quote unquote hold water, but who cares? <laughs> they create new thought. And there's a th absolute through line of Olson's exit from the official world, from politics and from academia to the counterculture of the 60s. And it's completely evident at the Berkeley Poetry Conference. People who come there from the Detroit Artists Workshop. There's a through line from Origin and Black Mountain Review to Yugen and Floating Bear, to the East Village Other, to the Black Panther Party paper. And if you start to look at it as a piece, you see that Olson is a major figure in thought. And it isn't poetry per se, there's great poetry, but what he managed to achieve was poetry that had the force of ancient texts, 
and he thought about the curriculum. What do you need to know about glaciation? Why do you need to know about geography? Why do you need to know about Indian civilization on this con hemisphere? You know, you need to know because it's the only way we can make sense of where we are now. Out over the landscape view, as from Alexander Baker's still, stone wall, orchard, pasture, land bench over the river looking to Apple Row and the sergeant's other side, the scoop out of the surface of the earth. A lone woman sat there in young skirt, the gulls use it in early morning to drop mussels on the low tide rocks. Dogtown to the right, the ocean to the left, opens out the light, the river flowing at my feet, Gloucester to my back, the light hangs from the wheel of heaven, the great ocean in balance, the air is as wide as the light. Hesiod said the outer man was the bond with which Zeus bound Prometheus. The illusory is real enough, the suffering is not suffered, the foreknowledge is absolute. Okeanus hangs in the father, the father is, is before the beginning of bodily things. I think when you're beginning to formulate a new critical analysis of something, you really have to do some stumbling around at first because it's not straight out. You're making it up as you go along and you're dealing with cultural perceptions that may be rigid and that you're violating. One person or a group of people can clear the ground for other kinds of work to be done. And I think that this is again something very characteristic of this period and very characteristic of Olson in that Olson saw the work that he was doing as part of a much larger effort in which other people would find themselves in the work that they could do. But you know, like, <laughs> I mean, poetry is public. It is, I mean, you know, I know everyone here wants to go home. Why not? This is the stuff that should be society. It should be what runs the streets and runs your news because it's what runs your nation. That's all. It's a day's business. We do it at night. God damn it. Some people were completely electrified by Olson's taking the stage and not leaving and talking and not reading poetry and they were just like enthralled. So then I was thinking, well, like, what, what else was going on at the time? The Olsen thing was on the 23rd of July. Dylan went electric in Newport on the 25th. These are two people who are basically saying to their audience, no, I'm not going to give you the performance you thought I was going to give. I'm still myself. I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing and I'm just going to do it. And if that isn't good enough, I'm sorry, you know, go somewhere else, see another performance, you know. He did have experience also with the painters, um, like Larry Rivers and Franz Klein. They were all at Black Mountain, having gone there during the Second World War. The rise of abstraction in painting and the breaking apart of the standard forms of poetry occurred simultaneously. Detroit Museum has a huge mural by Diego Rivera. There were stairs, if you went to the left, there were some little stairs, and then there were some galleries on the end of those stairs. And I got up there, and there was Jackson Pollock. I just went. I just, I had, I had everything. I was, I, I turned Catholic, I turned religious. But then to go to Black Mountain and then connect, I met Franz Klein, and eventually I even met Jackson Pollock. And then there the, were the poets. They had already begun to get rid of the excess. And Olson taught it all the time. We must get rid of excess so you can get to the division. The, the New American Poetry uh, Anthology that was edited by Donald Allen, that included this whole idea, and it was new. And the New American 
painting, that abstraction, reached uh, over to Europe also. It was a flowering, if you want to call it nicely, you know, instead of an explosion, which is really the way it felt when you were in it. <laughs> There is no strict personal order for my inheritance. No Greek will be able to discriminate my body. An American is a complex of occasions, themselves a geometry of spatial nature. I have this sense that I am one with my skin. Plus this plus this, that forever the geography leans in on me. I compel, backwards I compel Gloucester to yield, to change. Polis is this. If one takes the culture, the, the, the culture that emerges from 1945, let's say, to 1975, uh, in total, the writers, the painters, the musicians, you're talking about a cultural explosion that you can put next to the Tang Dynasty, next to the Elizabethan era. And that period ends at some point. The, the defeat of the U.S., in Vietnam signals a completely different political structure that comes home to roost here. The margins for the kinds of lives that could have been led in the 50s and 60s start to disappear. In other words, the idea that one could live very cheaply somewhere and, you know, also communication, nature of communication changes. You begin to see when you study correspondences, you know, you begin to see correspondences begin to fall off in the 80s. When Robert Duncan talked about a new book, he was talking about a typescript that he sent to Denise Levertov and Denise sent it to somebody else. And it circulated like that for several years. I mean, Ed Dorn in his Olson lectures says about 1970 and the death of Olson, he says, something died besides the person. And I think that's true. Jack Kerouac dies in 1960, you know, a few months before Olson, Steve Jonas, not to mention, you know, Jimi Hendrix, et cetera, et cetera. Not to mention the murder of Kennedy, Martin Luther King, previously Malcolm X. From like 1965 to 1975, there's a wholesale change going on. And that obviously affects writing. Students were, look, like how many, three generations, four generations beyond Charles Olson? Even if they don't know about him, they're dealing with, with criticism in, in a world that has accepted and embraced that idea. Even if they don't know about him, they're dealing with, with criticism in a world that has accepted and embraced that idea. His influence is just like, like anybody else. Uh, their influence is simply that. It deals not only with their personality and their presence, but the ideas that they put out into the world, which keep on changing. Don't forget that in 1957, if you said poetry reading, people would say, what? We were not dealing with a predominantly oral poetry. We were dealing with written. And so that required a certain kind of formulaic thinking, but here was something else in, in which all, a lot of those old rules were violated. The rhythm is according to one's breath. The line is according to one's breath. So, so that that was what was being dealt with as a standard, not a form of a certain number of syllables and a certain number of words per line. There's rap. <laughs> you know, this, what does the spoken word, I, I, I had a, gave a lecture about this um, last year and people had forgotten that 
the, the people who hired me wanted me to talk about how the beats gave birth to the spoken word, which is entirely untrue because there were many strains of how that came about. And I, you know, Olson is just part of that cumulative effect that has resulted in what we know today. In his response to Levitov, Williams concluded his letter by saying, Poems are a serious business. No poet can be tolerated who wavers in their devotion to the art or their ability. The public is cruel because it is ignorant. Reading the Maximus poems is a rewarding, really to me thrilling experience. It is at first glance a poem that attracts the eye and comes off as a major contribution to the contemporary scene and may possibly go much further. like him. We were dancing. Where we were dancing, I cannot tell you. But Olsen was six foot something or other. Five, six. He was a tall, tall man. And my greatest height was four, ten and a half. And we were dancing together. And everyone thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I remember we went to we took the subway somewhere, and I don't know whether we were jumping the turnstile or whatever, but I think I have this vision of Charles way up there and, and the turnstile. <laughs> 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 he might have jumped it. I don't know. He had long legs. 